Hi guys, welcome back to my channel and also welcome back to the Truly Horror series, the series that I started here on this channel to look into the true stories, true events and true crimes behind certain horror movies, the behind the scenes things that are sometimes often scarier and stranger than the movies themselves. I know it's been a while since I released one of these episodes in the series, in fact I think the last one that came out was all the way back on the 5th of April, so a new episode is long overdue. And the last episode we talked about the toxic film set behind Stanley Kubrick's The Shining and the episode before that we talked about the real life crimes of Ed Gein, also known as the Butcher of Plainfield, who was the real life inspiration behind horror movies such as Silence of the Lambs, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Psycho. If you guys haven't seen those episodes yet, I will leave a link to that playlist here so you can go and check them out. Today we are talking about the true events and myths that were the inspiration behind the story and the plot of Robert Eggers' The Lighthouse, released in 2019. If you haven't seen The Lighthouse, then here is the synopsis. On a remote island, Ephraim Winslow arrives as a lighthouse keeper and assists his elderly supervisor, Thomas Wake. As the days pass, Winslow is haunted by strange and mysterious visions. Also, just be aware, if you haven't seen The Lighthouse yet, then this episode is going to include spoilers. So according to Robert Eggers, who directed and co-wrote the movie with his brother Max, there are multiple inspirations behind The Lighthouse, ranging from Herman Melville's story Moby Dick, which we can see in the character of Ephraim, with his obsession to get to and see the light. This is emulating Captain Ahab's obsession with the white whale. To Carl Jung's symbols and archetypes and Freudian theories, which we can see in the homoerotic tension between the two men, the phallic symbolism of the lighthouse and the domination and submissive dynamic between Wake and Winslow. There are also lots of references to both sea and Greek mythology throughout the movie and finally there is also the real life event known as the Smalls Lighthouse Tragedy and it is these two influences that we are going to talk about today. Before we had use of an electronic navigation system like we do today, there were lighthouses dotted around coastlines and harbours all over the world. The purpose of these being to warn sailors of dangerous areas where there were rocks, low water levels and strong currents. One such lighthouse is the Smalls Lighthouse, which is located off of the coast of Wales in the UK. The lighthouse was built on a cluster of rocks called the Smalls. It consisted of a platform that held both the light and living quarters for the keepers and then they sat on top nine tall oak pillars. The reason being so that any strong stormy waters and waves could just crash through the pillars without damaging the lighthouse itself. This original lighthouse was originally built in 1777 but has since been pulled down and rebuilt using stone but there is still a model of the original lighthouse in the Science Museum in London. Typically, lighthouses were staffed or manned by two men who would do a month-long shift and then leave, be replaced by two other men, and then at a later date, they would come back and do another month shift. These men were affectionately known as wikis, and two such wikis that manned the Smalls Lighthouse were Thomas Griffith and Thomas Howell, and that is who our story is about today. Like a lot of wikis, as it was only a one month shift, Thomas Howell and Thomas Griffith also had other occupations. Howell was a cooper who, using wood, would make things like barrels, caskets, troughs, boxes, and Griffith was a labourer. Both men lived in Solva with their wives and families, and it was well known that Thomas Howell and Thomas Griffith did not get along together at all. I was unable to find out if there was a particular reason for this disagreement, whether it was a particular grudge or event that had happened, or if they just clashed as personalities. But what was clear is that these two men did not get along and would often bicker an argument very openly. In 1801, Howell and Griffith would set sail over the ocean to the Smalls Lighthouse for their next one month shift. One thing that came up a lot in my research was comments from people saying how it would take a particular type of person to be able to do this job, to man a lighthouse, because of the isolation and the dangerous nature of the job. This observation could not be more applicable to this story because both Howell and Griffith were seriously tested during this one month shift, as sadly, a couple of weeks into the shift, Griffith fell ill after a freak accident. Howell initially tried to help his colleague but was unable to, so instead they hoisted a distress signal. Unfortunately though, after waiting for a ship to arrive, no help came for the men and 
And after weeks of suffering, Griffith eventually died of his injuries and illness. Hoping that rescue would still come, Howell initially kept Griffith's body in the living quarters of the lighthouse with him. But the weeks went on and eventually they turned into months and still no help arrived for the surviving Howell. And the smell of Griffith's decomposing body began to become unbearable. You have to bear in mind that the living quarters of this lighthouse were tiny and Howell is trapped inside because of the storm raging outside and he's trapped inside with the smell of the decomposing body of his colleague. I defy anyone to not be pushed to the edge with those living environments. Howell considered throwing Griffith's body into the ocean, but he began to worry that if he did this, people might suspect him of murder. After all, it was well known that the two men did not get along. What was to stop people wondering if he had snapped in the isolation and killed him? So instead, Howell decided to put the body outside of the lighthouse. Because of his skills as a cooper, he was able to fashion a coffin from wood from a bulkhead in the lighthouse, and he put the body in the box and then attached the coffin to the railings on the outside of the lighthouse. As the months went by, Howell's sanity began to crack. Isolated with nothing but a decomposing body for company, and as time went on, the rations went down. But during all of this, Howell kept work in the lighthouse, making sure that the light was burning every night. But as well as isolation and the lack of food, the storm that was battering against the lighthouse outside had hit the coffin so hard that it had damaged it, and Griffith's body was now partially visible and his arm had fallen out of the coffin. As the winds continued to blow outside, they made Griffith's arm bash against the window of the lighthouse. And to Howell, this appeared as if his dead colleague was tapping on the window and beckoning to him. Rescue attempts were made, but with the storm still raging on very strongly, it was impossible to get close enough to rescue them without being shipwrecked themselves. However, a few ships were able to get close enough to see what they thought was a figure. The stories do differ a little bit between seeing a figure standing at the top of the lighthouse and a figure waving to them from the platform. But either way, between seeing the light of the lighthouse lit every night and seeing someone appear alive and well, the people on these ships thought everything was hunky-dory. Four months later, a boat from Milford in Wales was able to reach the lighthouse and it was carrying two replacement wickies to relieve Griffith and Howell. When they finally found the two men, Griffith was long dead and Howell was broken. It was said that Howell's physical and mental state had changed so drastically that he was now no longer recognisable to even his closest friends. He was half starved, his hair had turned grey and he was teetering on the edge of madness. What is important about the story of Howell and Griffith is how their experience changed the protocol for staffing lighthouses. From then on, lighthouses would always be manned by three people instead of two for safety reasons. The other influence behind the lighthouse that I want to talk about today is that of the two characters from Greek mythology, Proteus and Prometheus. Robert Eggers has himself actually said that he wrote Wake as Proteus and Winslow as Prometheus. Proteus was a sea god, brother of Triton and son of Poseidon, and was well known as the Old Man of the Sea. Proteus supposedly lived on the island of Pharos, which housed the Lighthouse of Alexandria, which was supposed to be one of the Seven Wonders of the World. Proteus is known as the Old Man of the Sea because he was able to know all things that would come to pass but he would only tell the people that captured him. He was also known as a shapeshifter, and so he would take on different forms to avoid being captured. In the lighthouse, Wake is the older of the two men and is the perfect portrayal of a seafaring man. Throughout the movie, Wake regales Winslow with tales and myths and legends of the sea. He also accurately predicts Winslow's fate at the end of the movie. And there is some that consider the possibility that during Wake's impassioned speech, this is him actually cursing Winslow to his fate. A bulging bladder no more, but a blasted bloody film now a nothing for the RPs and the souls of dead sailors to pick and claw and feed upon only to be lapped up and swallowed by the infinite waters of the dread emperor himself. 
During this speech, Wake actually references the sea gods himself by saying, Hark, Triton, bellow, bid our father the sea king. And there's also a scene towards the end of the movie where Winslow has beaten Wake into submission and Wake is laying on the floor and he transforms into a sea god. Of course, this is probably just an hallucination of Winslow's like others in the movie, but it is never made explicitly clear whether all of these things are hallucinations of Winslow's as he gradually loses his sanity or if they are in fact real. Either way, it doesn't really matter, but the references to Greek mythology are clear throughout the film. Prometheus is a Greek titan, also known as the champion of humanity and the supreme trickster. Prometheus created humanity out of clay and it is said that he loved them more than the gods on Olympia. He defied Zeus, the king of the gods or god king or head king, um, whatever you want to call him, but he defied Zeus by stealing fire from the gods and gifting it to humanity. Prometheus's punishment for this was to be chained to a rock where every day an eagle would peck out his liver, which would then grow back only to be pecked out again the next day. And seeing as how Prometheus was immortal, he was doomed to this fate forever. The fire in this story is often considered to represent knowledge and information the light of the fire literally translating as enlightenment and Prometheus stealing it is meant to represent overreaching knowledge. In the lighthouse, the younger of the two, Winslow, is obsessed with getting to and seeing the light of the lighthouse. Refused by Wake, his obsession only grows, but by the end of the movie, after killing Wake, Winslow finally gets to the top of the lighthouse and looks into the light. The light then engulfs not only Winslow, but the entire scene, and we see Winslow change from exhilarated laughter to manacle screaming as he descends into madness, and it's almost as if Winslow has seen answers and knowledge that humanity are not meant to know, and he too, like Prometheus, Prometheus is punished for overreaching. And the end scene of the movie shows us the audience Winslow's fate, which is very similar to that of Prometheus. So there you have it guys, the inspirations behind Robert Eggers' The Lighthouse, some based in true events and some based in mythology. I for one found this movie absolutely fascinating and I really, really enjoyed researching not only the inspirations behind the film, but the hidden meanings within it as well. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode as well. Let me know if you did down in the comments. Also, let me know if you have any ideas, suggestions or recommendations for future episodes in the Truly Horror series. But in the meantime, thank you as always for stopping by. I really do appreciate it. Take care of yourselves and I will talk to you in the next episode. Bye guys.